Tonight's speaker, I think very special, Lorenzo Vidino, is the director of the program on extremism at George Washington University. He's uh, a native of Italy. He earned a uh, law degree from the University of Milan and a doctorate in international relations from Tufts University. Dr. Vidino is an expert on uh, Islamism in Europe and North America, and he'll be talking about both, as a matter of fact. He's the author of uh, several books, including the New Muslim Brotherhood in the West, as well as a number of scholarly articles. And he told me over lunch that he also spends part of his time testifying at trials of terrorists. And that in itself is interesting. I hope you'll make some reference to that as well. In any case, please welcome Lorenzo Vedino to Camden County College. Thank you very much. And it's well, it's very high. <laughs> it's a real pleasure to be here. I'm going to walk a bit here. I try to make it a bit more, more informal. It's, uh, it's late in the evening. I think it makes it a bit livelier. And uh, first of all, I really want to thank all of you for coming. I understand it's obviously right before the holidays. Happy Easter, Chach Sameach to everybody. And I really appreciate you coming here. Uh, I don't have uh, a PowerPoint. I have what it's called the, the Italian PowerPoint, which is just excessive hand gestures. Uh, but I hope you can bear with me when, uh, and I'll try to make it uh, sort of a lively, uh, lively presentation at the beginning and then a lively conversation with you all uh, after my initial remarks. Um, do we we want to cover a broad uh, topic, which is ISIS, jihadist terrorism in Europe and in the United States. Uh, and that's obviously a very, very big topic uh, and one which is ever shifting. I um, took advantage of the fact that I was in the, the Philadelphia area today and I went to see uh, some friends at the, um, the FBI field office in, in Philadelphia and, our, and we talked about the last time when I was in, in Philly giving a, a similar talk and it was six years ago. And the conversation was completely different. The presentation that I gave six years ago, which is not that long ago, was completely different. Uh, think back at the situation when it comes to jihadist terrorism uh, in 2012, and it was generally a mood of optimism uh, that throughout Western capitals reigned. Uh, Bin Laden had just been killed. We hadn't seen a major terrorist attack in the West. And the Arab Spring was its in early stages, which gave a lot of people, most people, uh, optimism. Uh, it was the idea of uh, uh, people in the Arab world coming out, challenging uh, dictators, uh, and demanding democracy, demanding transparency. There was none of the sort of jihadist slogans uh, uh, that, that Al Qaeda wanted. And I think there was a bit of also fatigue from a Western point of view after 10 years of war on terror. I think there was. Uh, almost a desire to uh, grasp every, sing, every possible positive sign that this phenomenon was uh, uh, on the decline. And I think we, we were all very optimistic and we thought it was, has become somewhat of a manageable uh, dynamic, it was on the decline. Uh, you had, yes, of course, the occasional terrorist attack here and there, um, the Boston Marathon bombing, in the United States, a few attacks uh, uh, in Europe, but nothing of the magnitude of 9-11, nothing of the magnitude of the, the Madrid or London uh, attacks in 2004-2005. Uh, the idea was, the mood was of optimism. And I think just two years after that, the situation was completely different. And what happened was the conflict in, uh, in Syria uh, really changed a lot of these dynamics. Uh, let me give you just by the numbers, the kind of mobilization that the conflict in Syria triggered in the West. We saw, these are official numbers given by the United Nations, 6,000 Europeans who traveled uh, from Europe to Syria and Iraq and joined ISIS and other groups. Uh, that's an unprecedented number. We've always seen this kind of mobilizations of individuals from Europe, from the West, going to, uh, to Bosnia in the 90s, even before that to Afghanistan in the 80s, to Iraq in 2003, 2004, uh, to Chechnya in the 90s, but we were talking about dozens, maybe hundreds of individuals. 6,000 is an unprecedented number. Uh, it's a statistically insignificant number um, from a demographic point of view. 
out of a Muslim population of 25, estimated 25 million Muslims living in Western Europe. It's a statistically insignificant number, but it is a very, very high number from a security point of view. Different dynamics in the United States, 250, 300, that's the number that the FBI generally gives in terms of Americans who traveled or attempted to travel, that's sort of the FBI phrasing for it, um, to Syria and Iraq. So very different uh, numbers. What we've also seen is a very, very high number of attacks in the West. Uh, we've seen uh, since the declaration of the caliphate, so June 29, 2014, we've seen 67 attacks in the West. Of course, not all attacks are the same. I think you have some dynamics where it's even difficult to, to really know whether you can categorize it as an attack or not. Um, and we've seen, of course, some terrorist attacks uh, uh, that have been very, very large, very sophisticated, very deadly. Think about the, uh, the coordinated attacks in Paris in November 2015, with the attack at the, the Bataclan, the concert hall, the stadium, uh, and a couple of cafes throughout Paris. And we've seen some other attacks which are very, actually the majority of them statistically, relatively unsophisticated. Uh, one guy uh, getting a knife, getting a weapon, stabbing people left and right, maybe injuring a few people, not necessarily killing uh, people. The attack we saw the other day uh, in southern France, in Provence, with one individual uh, basically uh, barricading himself inside a supermarket in France and killing four people. Uh, this is sort of the attacks uh, we have seen. Uh, Here's where we have the first situation where the United States is particular. I've said the number of, the of individuals who have mobilized to go to Syria has been relatively low compared to Europe, but the United States is the second country in the West in terms of attacks. France has suffered 21 attacks, first one. The United States is second with 15 attacks. Now again, in the United States, most of the attacks have been relatively unsophisticated but we have seen a few that have been quite deadly. Orlando, with the trial going on now, 49 people killed. San Bernardino, Chattanooga. We've seen quite a few acts that have, uh, that have been quite lethal, quite, quite deadly. Now, what has caused this, this mobilization? It has been largely the success uh, that ISIS has had on two levels. The first one is the success on the battlefield. The ability that ISIS has had to uh, establish the territorial presence, to create de facto a state uh, of a very large uh, size. By uh, June 2014, the territory ISIS controlled was basically the size of France. Granted, most of it was desert between Syria and Iraq, but it was still a very large territory. And that success the ability that the group had to create a state in the heart of the Arab world and to then give the mantle of religious legitimacy to that territory by declaring it a caliphate, it's something unique. The jihadist movement, and I will call it the jihadist movement, uh, to refer to all the groups, all the organizations that over the last 40, 50 years have been active initially in the Middle East and then globally, uh, and embrace the idea that the only legitimate state is one that is ruled by a strict interpretation of Islamic law, and that violence, what they refer to as jihad, which is of course a, a, a term that most Muslims would reject in that sense, but that jihad, that violence, is the only legitimate way to, um, to further that goal, to achieve that goal of creating an Islamic state, both groups have been operating for 40, 50 years. They never got even close to what ISIS did, to creating a state. They always aspired to do that. Uh, there were attempts to do that. Uh, Al-Qaeda tried to do that in Yemen, in Mali, but never got close to it. And the few times he managed to, to control territory, it was always for a few months and then some, uh, some power sort of stepped in and, and de defeated them militarily. Uh, ISIS achieved something completely different, created a territory, it was relatively stable, it was relatively large, 
and it had the declaration of the caliphate, which, of course, the vast, vast majority of Muslims worldwide rejected, rejected vehemently. They did not recognize it as a state, but within the jihadist, the informal jihadist community worldwide, most people recognized it as, as a state. And that was very attractive to people worldwide. Again, United Nations numbers estimate around 60 to 70,000 people from all over the world joined the group uh, in Syria and Iraq. And as I said, 6,000 from Europe, 250, 300 from, uh, from the US, 200 and 250 from Canada. So around almost 7,000 from the West, give or take. Those are very, very large numbers. What motivated these individuals? We often use the word radicalization. That's sort of the buzzword that we hear a lot. The individual was radicalized. His radicalization process took place in that way. And that's, that's a very contested term. It's a very subjective term. It is the term of art that we, we use all the time. And radicalization is often defined as the process uh, through which an individual embraces uh, an extremist ideology, an ideology that is at odds with the mainstream and that includes uh, the support for violence in order to achieve uh, his goals. Now, radicalization can happen in regard to any kind of ideology. Uh, jihadism doesn't have the monopoly of violence. We see radicalization and terrorism motivated by all sorts of ideologies, left wing, right wing, uh, you name it. Uh, but obviously, uh, we've seen globally that jihadist uh, radicalization is sort of, uh, by, from a quantitative and qualitative point of view, uh, the main challenge that most countries, particularly in the West, have to, uh, have to face. What triggers the radicalization process? How is it that 6,000 individuals in Europe, 250 individuals in, uh, in the United States, decide to leave? How is it that an even larger number of people uh, do not necessarily leave, but still embrace the same ideology. And it's a very complicated subject, and I think this is where uh, both the academic, the law enforcement, the policy-making communities have been struggling to find answers uh, uh, as to what motivates uh, people. What we do at the, um, at the center, you, you mentioned the, 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 the small outfit that I, that I uh, had at, at George Washington University. We look at, uh, we try to really dig deep into the, the individuals in the United States who have either gone to Syria and Iraq or have been arrested in the United States for ISIS-related activities. There's been around 120 people who have been arrested in the United States uh, since May 2013. First arrest in the US for ISIS, around 120 people. And we really try to dig deep. We get all the court records. Uh, we, uh, we try to attend the trials. I testify in some of those. Uh, we try to talk to the FBI agents in charge of the case. We try to talk to the prosecutors, the defense attorneys, the families of the defendants. Uh, we really try to get as much information as possible. We have a small team that looks at social media. Uh, we'll talk about how important the internet is in all this. And we try to understand who are they, what, what, what leads them in that direction. And the one answer we get to is that there is no one answer. There is no common profile. From any kind of perspective, you look at these individuals, you're going to find that diversity is the name of the game. Uh, the, their profiles, they're as diverse as you can imagine. From an age point of view, we're talking about teenagers and individuals in their 50s and 60s. We're talking about men and women. Uh, in most European countries now, 25 to 30 percent of people who are charged with ISIS-rated activities are women. Uh, we're talking about individuals who are born in the faith, but we're talking about a very large number of converts. In the United States, we're talking about 35 percent of individuals who, who have uh, been arrested for ISIS-rated activities are converts to Islam. And again, even among those converts, big differences, big diversity. You'll find Caucasians, you'll find African Americans, you'll find Latinos, you even find two Jewish kids who converted and, and tried to join ISIS. Um, and again, age, big gaps, gender, big gaps. Uh, Socioeconomic point of view, absolutely no matter to the madness. You will find some individuals who are misfits. You will find some individuals who have very serious uh, uh, personal challenges, uh, broken families, 
psychological, even psychiatrical issues in some cases, uh, poorly adjusted individuals, uh, individuals who have who would have taken some bad trajectory no matter what. It just happened that the bad trajectory they took was jihadist, was ISIS. It could have been any other bad trajectory. But you find individuals who are seemingly very well adjusted. You find individuals who go to good graduate schools, who have good families, who have uh, uh, basically everything you would, uh, you would think would qualify to make it a, a well-adjusted and well-rounded person. What drives them then? And I think it's the idea of where radicalization studies is going is that there's different levels where you can look at these dynamics. There's not just one lens through it, uh, to, which one should look, should look at this. Traditionally, there's always been this approach of looking at radicalization from uh, a socioeconomic point of view. And I think that's particularly true when it comes to the European setting. I think that's a, that's a, a, a narrative that I, I've always strongly opposed, uh, but it's fairly, or at least was fairly common in a lot of policy circles, particularly in the US, which is American Muslims are well integrated, so we don't have a lot of radicalization. European Muslims are poorly integrated, so there's much larger radicalization in Europe. And I think that's uh, a very um, appealing argument. It's simple, it makes sense from a logical point of view. Instinctively, I think we can all uh, agree, makes sense. Uh, you're not integrated, you're not part of the society, you hate that society, you radicalize. Uh, and it is true, undeniably true, that American, the history, uh, the, 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 the story of American Muslims is largely with exceptions, of course, but largely a success story compared to the, the, the history of European Muslims, uh, which is much more problematic. Uh, again, obviously, we're talking about very complicated dynamics. Every country in Europe would deserve a different analysis. But it is true that uh, no matter from what perspective you look at it, the history of American Muslims, it's a success story. Just uh, the average income of Muslim American families higher than the average American uh, family's income. Uh, well, that's completely different in Europe where uh, no matter what country you look at, some countries might be a bit better than others, but European Muslims unfortunately lag at the bottom uh, of, of society no matter, uh, what, no matter what indicator you look at. Uh, income, unemployment, access to education, uh, any, any indicator tells you pretty much a bad story about, about um, uh, European Muslim communities. Having said that, bad equation, lack of integration equals radicalization is deeply flawed and debunked by evidence, very much so. Let me give you a few examples. Um, I mentioned there's 6,000 European Muslims who have gone uh, to Syria and Iraq and join ISIS. Now, if you look at the mobilization, it's not evenly divided among European countries. You'll find, for example, that the countries that have given the highest per capita number of foreign fighters are the countries that have the best levels of integration. Sweden, paradise, the idyllic society, and indeed it is. Uh, it provides all its citizens, including new arrivals, with uh, a level of, of welfare, of, uh, of benefits that is extremely generous. 350 foreign fighters. Austria, another country that is extremely generous with the welfare system. And if you look at the Muslim population in Austria when it comes to um, employment, access to education, the levels are relatively good. 400 foreign fighters. Now you look at, of course, I'm Italian, I'm biased, but I will uh, bear with me, I'm trying to be, to be neutral here. Which is the country that has the lowest level of foreign fighters per capita in Europe? Italy, 110, 120, I'm sure it's the latest number. Uh, is Italy a good country when it comes to integration? No, it's a terrible country, and that's my known patriotic side that comes out. Uh, there's a reason why all the migrants that come from uh, North Africa, from the Middle East, uh, uh, and come uh, on a daily basis on Italian shores, uh, they immediately want to get the heck out 
of Italy and want to head north to Germany, to Austria, to Sweden, to Holland, because those are wealthier countries where integrating, where receiving benefits, uh, where, having, where they have more opportunities. Yet there is this paradox. So I'm not being the devil's advocate here in saying that lack of integration is the antidote to radicalization. That's obviously nonsense. That's, I mean, facetious here. But it's food for thought that the countries that fare the best when it comes to integration are the countries that have the highest numbers of foreign fighters. And all the indicators of radicalization are higher than countries like Italy, like Spain, like Greece, which are terrible from an integration point of view, yet have seen very low levels of radicalization. Second little example to debunk this all lack of integration equals radicalization. Um, you look at certain countries, you'll notice a pattern throughout. And the pattern is radicalization is about who you know. Radicalization happens in groups. Radicalization happens in hubs. Let me give an example. And the example is a very famous one, is the one of Belgium. Now, after the Paris attacks, after the Brussels attack, there was a lot of talk about Belgium as being a very problematic state. Belgium, indeed, has had extremely high levels of radicalization. We're talking about 650 foreign fighters from tiny Belgium. Uh, that's a disproportionately high number of, uh, of individuals who radicalize. And obviously, most famously, some of the Belgian foreign fighters were the perpetrators of the attacks in Paris and then in Brussels. The famous Molenbeek cell. Molenbeek is the uh, neighborhood in, in Brussels from which many of the perpetrators of those attacks hail from. It was basically a group of friends from the neighborhood who went to Syria and came back and carried out those attacks. Now, you look at Belgium, and it's 650 foreign fighters, as I said. Um, now, as all intelligence agencies, law enforcement agencies do, uh, they do social network analysis. They look at who are these individuals. The Belgians look at who are these 650 individuals and where do they come from. And if you look at it from a map, bad mobilization, those foreign fighters are not evenly divided on a Belgian map. They actually, basically 90% of them come from three cities. They come from Brussels, they come from Antwerp, and they come from a relatively small town of 45,000 people called Filforde, which probably none of you has ever heard of, and me, myself until three years ago when this whole phenomenon started, I'd never heard of. Uh, and it's a relatively nice, pretty town of 45,000 people from which 65 foreign fighters came from. Huge number. Now, as Belgium been bad at integrating its Muslim population? Yes. As Belgium, uh, uh, does the Belgian Muslim community suffer from uh, a lack of integration? Yes. Uh, has there been issues with discrimination of Muslims in Belgium? Yes, absolutely. But why is it then that even though the Muslim population is, not, is relatively uh, evenly spread throughout Belgium, it's only people from those three cities that mobilized? Why is it that Muslims from other places like Mechelen, like Ghent, like uh, uh, other Belgian towns, Bruges, they did not mobilize, but it's just from those three cities. Is it that integration is better in those three cities than in, uh, uh, or worse in those three cities than in others? Clearly not. We talk a lot about the internet, and we'll get to that. The importance of the internet. The internet radicalizes people. Is the Wi-Fi connection better in those three cities compared to the, other, the rest of Belgium? Clearly not. So there must be something else. There must be a reason as to why that mobilization is unevenly divided on Belgian territory. And I take Belgium as an example. I can give an example in every other European country. And the reason is, if you then look at it, you dig deeper, you'll see that in Belgium, in those three cities, there were two networks, two militant organizations that for years had been recruiting people. And there were three or four charismatic individuals who had created a scene, a milieu, a network, an environment around themselves which before the beginning of the Syria war was nonviolent, but that once the Syrian conflict began, 
immediately turned that network into a pipeline that went to Syria. And if you look, you do those kind of uh, charts that law enforcement intelligence agencies like to do with circles and arrows connecting people, you will see that, again, I, I should, do, should have done better than the Italian PowerPoint. Uh, you will see that all these individuals were connected. And what happened is that the first mobilization, six months as, uh, after the conflict started in Syria, the leaders of those networks left. Then they started calling the second tier, the third tier, the brothers, the cousins, the classmates, and everybody was basically connected to that. Radicalization is about who you know. So I'm not saying that the social conditions are not important. It's, it, it's a factor. There's no analysis of radicalization that can discard elements that have to do with the socio-political and economic circumstances and environment uh, surrounding the individuals who radicalize, but it's not just about that. That's why the simplistic explanations, oh, they radicalize because they're poor, they radicalize because uh, they're discriminated. It's a factor, undeniably, but why is it that it affects certain areas and not, and not others? Why is it that it affects certain individuals uh, and not others? It is often about, as I said, about who you know. And that's probably one of the main reasons why we don't see a large mobilization in the United States. As I said, we've not seen large numbers in the US. Is it because American Muslims are better integrated? That's probably a factor. I'm not gonna say that it's not a factor, but it's irrelevant. But if you then look at the profiles of people who have radicalized, both in Europe and the United States, you'll see that plenty of individuals are actually quite well integrated and from a socioeconomic point of view are relatively, uh, I'm not gonna say affluent, but relatively well to do. Let's go to, back to Belgium. Uh, we use Belgium as a bit of an example. Molenbeek, this part of, uh, of Brussels, which was, has been under the spotlight because has seen that cell that carried out the attack, and 60 residents of just that one neighborhood left to go to Syria and Iraq to join ISIS. Very big number. Now, is Molenbeek a problematic neighborhood? Yes, it is, although I would argue you can find a lot of worse neighborhoods in Europe or in the United States. Uh, but if you look at Molenbeek, you also see another two dynamics that are interesting. It's really, you know, uh, going deep into certain cases allows you not to make wide and sweeping uh, assessments which are not grounded in facts. You could dig a bit deeper into what happened in Molenbeek and who are the people who left from Molenbeek, you'll see two things. One is that most of the individuals who left from Molenbeek were not really poorly integrated. The very famous guy who led the cell uh, that carried out the attack, Abdelhamid Abaoud. You might remember him, it was the, um, the guy in one of the ISIS videos uh, that drives a, a tractor and he has bodies of Syrian soldiers that he drags uh, behind him. That's the guy who then carried out the attacks in Paris. He's, uh, and he's the leader of the cell. His father was a, very, uh, is a relatively wealthy merchant of Moroccan descent who made it in Belgium. Had a small chain of stores and sent his son, Abdelhamid, to private school, sent him to one of the best private schools in Brussels to which two Belgian prime ministers come from. Same school, yet Abdelhamid decided to go the jihadi route and not the prime minister route. But it's not a matter of integration per se. So clearly not about that. There's a second phenomenon that is interesting about Molenbeek, which again dispels a lot of, a lot of issues. Molenbeek is a neighborhood with a Muslim majority and it's two large groups, basically. Uh, the Muslim population there is basically divided 45% Moroccan, 45% Turkish, 10% mix. So the two big groups are the Turks and the Moroccans. You look at the 60 foreign fighters, 59 of them are of Moroccan background. One of them is of Turkish background. Turkish guy, actually, funny story, goes because his girlfriend is Moroccan and she has left her to go join ISIS, so he follows his girlfriend to, to Syria. It's a bit of a bizarre story. So why is it that radicalization affects the Moroccan population much more than the Turkish population? 
You look at income, Moroccan community in Molenbeek fares better than the Turkish community. Better integrated, speaks the language better, they're francophone, they speak French. Uh, they have, from all points of view, better integration than the Turkish community. Yet, Turkish community seems to be immune to radicalization, except for the, the, the guy who wants to follow his girlfriend. And the Moroccan community seems to have a much bigger problem. It's, it's complicated. That's what I'm, what I'm trying to say. Uh, and let me take it back to what I was saying about the United States. Why is it that we have significantly lower levels of radicalization in the United States? The analysis that is often given is because American Muslims are better integrated. As I said, it's potentially one factor. I'm not willing to say that it's, it has nothing to do. Uh, but it probably has something to do also with the fact that in the United States, we've never, with a few exceptions, we've never seen the presence of those charismatic recruiters, uh, of those organizations that have played such a big role in radicalizing uh, cross sections of European Muslim communities, and they never existed in the United States, with a few exceptions. Again, the Belgium example. I mentioned those organizations which played such a big role in, uh, in radicalizing um, European Muslims. Uh, the very famous case in Belgium is a group called Sharia for Belgium. Uh, Sharia for Belgium was this very bizarre group that started uh, being active in Belgium around 2007, 2008. Uh, and they were, uh, as Belgian government officials call them, buffoons. They were never taken very seriously. These are the guys who would show up on a Saturday afternoon, 20, 25 of them wearing military, uh, sort of traditional Arabic garb and military jackets, uh, waving a big uh, black flag in front of the royal palace in Brussels, saying, this is today the, the, the house of an infidel of the king of Belgium. In the future will be the uh, Sharia court, the Islamic court of the Islamic state of Belgistan. Nonsense. It was uh, sort of a, they were seen as the clowns of uh, sort of the, the, the militant Islamic scene. And Belgian authorities, for two reasons, never paid much attention to them. First of all, because, you know, dog that bark doesn't bite. You know, I'm, I'm going to be, the assessment was, I'm going to be more concerned about those individuals who lay low, are the real terrorists. If you're a real terrorist, you're not going to put on a show like that on a Saturday afternoon. You lay low and uh, you, you, you act in a more professional way. Uh, second, doing what this group was doing is not illegal. There's nothing illegal. Now, laws change from country to country. Uh, freedom of speech is, is diff there's different latitudes of what is tolerated speech and accepted speech in different Western countries. But in most countries, doing something like that, showing up and saying, this is the future, uh, you know, that we're going to turn Belgium into an Islamic state, this is going to be Belgistan, it's not illegal. It obviously raises some red flags in law enforcement intelligence uh, agencies, but you can't you can arrest somebody for that. You can prosecute somebody for that. Now, in the US, for a variety of reasons, there never been the, there's never been the presence of those kind of radicalizing agents, those charismatic preachers, uh, those militant organizations that have been so influential in certain milieus uh, in Europe in radicalizing people, they never really existed. If you look at who American jihadists are, if you try to do the same kind of chart that we talked about in Belgium, when everybody's connected, everybody kind of knows everybody, that's not the same in the US. That would be a much more difficult chart for me to do in my Italian PowerPoint, because these guys are not really connected. It's one guy here, one guy there. What plays a major role in the US, it's the internet. Now, there's not a single case in, in the West nowadays that doesn't see some kind of role for the internet. Everybody's online, everybody's on social media, a lot of radicalization happens on, uh, on social media. Everybody that radicalizes, in most cases, there's a combination of online and offline radicalization. 
Now, I kind of hate when, especially journalists, have sort of a lazy approach to it. They, somebody gets arrested, um, everybody Googles uh, the person's name, or they go on Facebook, they look him up, they see that he has a profile, they go, ha-ha, online radicalization. Well, not so simple. You know, like all of us, there's an online life that we live, but there's also an offline life, which is sometimes a bit more difficult to, to track for obvious reasons. Most cases, it's a combination. Now, the, 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 the balance between online and offline might differ from case to case, uh, but it's a combination of both. In a European setting, the offline component tends to be more important because of the presence of this charismatic individuals, these networks, these pipelines, in some cases linked to mosques. Uh, as somebody put it, you really have to be quite dumb, not if you live in London, in Paris, in Brussels, not to be able to find somebody who's an ISIS, who's connected with some degree of separation, but they can hook you up with, with ISIS and have you especially in the years when the mobilization was Syria-bound, it, it was fairly easy to find somebody in the physical space. You just had to kind of ask around, go to the, the right mosque, but it was fairly, fairly easy. In a US setting, it's completely different. You don't, save for a very, very limited number of exceptions, you don't have those kind of networks in the physical space. So the dynamic what, uh, that, that takes place in many cases is that individuals start a radicalization process here in the US in small groups of like-minded individuals, two or three friends, siblings, it's a fairly common dynamic, husband and wife, remember the San Bernardino couple, husband and wife who carried out the attack, um, siblings, there was a very famous case of three brothers, the Khan brothers arrested in Chicago, uh, two of them minors, the older one 19. They radicalize together, you radicalize, and in some cases just by yourself. Uh, one way or the other, you, you start getting attracted by ISIS, ISIS propaganda. Uh, and then, of course, as your commitment, your interest in that propaganda gets deeper, you, you want to connect with like-minded individuals. In the United States, again, with, a few, with exceptions, it's quite difficult to do so in the physical space. So what you do is you go online. You naturally go online and you try to connect to people. And you try to connect to like-minded individuals. Uh, and obviously there's, uh, there are people who are relatively savvy in how they do that, and some who are not, are quite unsavvy. Uh, and that's the space in which the FBI intervenes. That's, where, that's how most of the cases uh, uh, are initiated is by monitoring that space that exists on certain social media, uh, on, on Facebook, on Twitter. It has recently moved to Telegram. It has uh, sort of been mig progressively migrating to more encrypted platforms, which makes it difficult uh, to track. But that's a space in which the FBI detects individuals who are radicalized. But here we get to the big problem. I take you a bit to, to the perspective of law enforcement and intelligence agencies when it comes to this. We go back to what I was saying about, um, about the, uh, the, the Sharia for Belgium, the guys who scream in front of the, the, the royal palace in Brussels. It is not illegal, it is not a criminally relevant behavior to be an ISIS sympathizer. It's, perf it's protected speech, particularly in a country like the US, under the First Amendment, but in most European countries as well, to say that ISIS is a good organization. It's not per se uh, a criminally relevant behavior to talk to other people about how great ISIS is, to be a sympathizer. And that is one of the big challenges that all Western countries in different ways are facing right now, is the gray area of individuals who are clearly radicalized, clearly espouse ISIS ideology, but have never crossed, but have not crossed uh, the, the, the threshold from thought to action. Now, you often hear after an attack, that's statistically, in most attacks that we have seen, whether in Europe or in the United States, what we often hear a few hours after the attack the perpetrator was known to law enforcement. 
the FBI knew about this guy. The intelligence agency, so and so, and the MI5, Scotland Yard, they knew about this guy. And of course, the immediate criticism is, but why didn't they act? They knew about this guy. He was known. He was a radical. They had him, they monitored him. Well, easier said than done. Um, if we were in certain Middle East, in some Middle Eastern countries, then uh, being a radical is not a constitutionally protected behavior. Uh, people who are, who espouse certain ideas are simply snatched in the middle of the street, taken to some prison, and uh, if you're lucky, you get out in a couple of years after a bit of torture. If you're not lucky, you never see the light of day again. That's how it happens in some countries. In the West, that's not how it works. And I'm very happy that's not how it works. But obviously that creates a problem, which is, again, what do you do with this kind of individuals? Let me give you the French example, which shows you a bit the magnitude of the problem. Now, the French have a system, it's called the, the fichier S, so the file S, letter S, uh, where basically they put it under that file, they open a file for every individual, they at some point detect and assess to be radicalized. There's different degrees, obviously, of intensity of radicalization, but the number they gave in December is 18,000 individuals who are on that fichier S, who are known to be radical. In the United States, at some point, the former director of the FBI spoke about 3,000 individuals who are known to be ISIS sympathizers. That was a year and a half ago, well, almost two years ago. What do you do with these individuals? And the big challenge is, uh, how to monitor these guys and how to step in. Now, the first step is, of course, the first answer is, how do you monitor these people? Well, there's two major challenges there. The first challenge is from a legal point of view. You can't monitor people. Again, laws change from country to country, but you have to have an authorization from a judge. You need to go in front of a judge, make a case as to why this individual has to be monitored, and then you get an authorization from the judge, if you get it, uh, if you motivate your case well. And then that authorization is generally given for a certain amount of time. You cannot monitor a person unless you have good reasons for years and years. Second thing is resources. Most countries have very limited resources. How many people do you think are needed to monitor an individual for 24 hours. How many law enforcement agents you need? Around 25. People work in eight hour shifts. They're human beings, eight, eight hour shifts. And you generally need seven to eight people per shift because you need five more or less, five people to monitor the person in the physical space, like in the movies. If I'm following you, you know, it's gonna be me, but it's gonna be somebody else, because at some point you're gonna spot me, then I'm burned, there needs to be another agent, and then one drives, one maybe is in a helicopter, one is in a motorbike, and then you need people to listen to the phone conversations, you need people to look at uh, uh, what they're doing online, and that needs to be done in real time, and in many cases that require translators, because it might be in Arabic, uh, in, uh, in Pashto, in, in Urdu, in, in other languages. Uh, so generally eight people per shift, three shifts a day, 25 people. Now I'm terrible at math, but do 25, 18,000 times, that's the number of the people the French have. It's a huge number. We're getting in the realm of, well, I'm terrible at math, but you're getting the hundreds of thousands of law enforcement agents that would be needed to monitor those individuals. Assuming the judge gives an order you know, to monitor, there's, 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 a, there's a court order and, and so on and so forth. It's basically impossible. No one, uh, no country has the manpower to do it. I mean, in the US, we have a very large law enforcement community. Uh, laws are relatively favorable, and the number of individuals who are radicalized is not as high as in most European countries. Still, 
the FBI doesn't have the resource to monitor anybody who's radicalized. And, and honestly, do you need 25 FBI agents to monitor a 15-year-old kid who puts like on a Facebook post about how great ISIS is? Probably not. In some cases, yes. But you never know. You never know who is the guy uh, who's going to make the leap from simply being a cognitive radical, somebody who has certain thoughts, to being an actual terrorist, to actually pulling the trigger or doing what, uh, uh, or doing something. Um, I had a conversation recently with uh, an FBI um, agent who were talking about the Sarpov case. Sarpov is that uh, gentleman who um, carried out the attack in southern Manhattan, uh, driving a truck uh, in the pedestrian uh, area near the World Trade Center. And Sarpa was known to the FBI, to some degree. But the way he put it, the agent was spot on. And he said, listen, even if we had known, even if we had tailed Sarpov, we had the resources, we had put 25 people on Sarpov, there was no sign that Sarpov was going to carry out an attack. It's not like he went, we woke up in the morning and went on Facebook and said, today's the day, finally going to do it, finally going to kill people. No sign, nothing on social media, nothing like that. We know he's radicalized. It's been two years that Sarpov is online looking at jihadi propaganda, talking to people who are problematic. We know he's in that space mentally. But there's no sign in that specific day that he's going to do something. Now, he goes and rents a truck. Now, that's an issue. We all know that ISIS has been calling for attacks using rented trucks. We saw what happened in Nice. We saw what happened in Berlin. We saw what happened in Stockholm, different attacks carried out with the same uh, modus operandi. So he rents a truck, red flag. What do you do? You arrest him for what? Having rented a truck? Can't really do that. So you, what do you do? You, you tail him. You go behind him. What does it take for Sarpo to simply make a right turn at a stop and go on a pedestrian street even if you have 15 FBI cars behind him? So there are certain attacks that cannot be stopped. There are certain individuals where the law, uh, matter of resources, capabilities, make it pretty much impossible to, uh, to stop certain, certain dynamics. And of course, you, you hear after attacks that, that reaction, um, you know, of course, the criticism of law enforcement, which in many cases does make a lot of mistakes. Don't, don't get me wrong, I'm not here saying that you know, law enforcement are, are great in everything they do and they always get it right and it's not their fault for any attack that happens. In many cases, there are major screw-ups. Uh, I think if you've been following the, the trial of, uh, related to the Orlando attack, you'll see that some issues there, clearly. Uh, but it is, in many cases, a very, very difficult task for law enforcement when the vast, vast majority of uh, of attacks have been perpetrated by individuals who have been in that gray area for a long time and at some point have moved. I'll give you another example which is extremely frustrating from the French perspective. You remember the attack in January 2015 against Charlie Hebdo, the satirical magazine in Paris uh, where two terrorists, uh, uh, two brothers, the Koashi brothers, uh, went inside and killed basically everybody they found in that magazine which had published a lot of things that were considered offensive uh, to Islam. Uh, the Koshi brothers were extremely well known to French intelligence. Uh, one of them had been to Iraq back in 2005, first mobilization for Iraq. They had very, very strong connections to Al-Qaeda and so on. Uh, one of them has served, uh, served time in prison. Now, by 2010, French authorities put a lot of people on them. Those are the guys, of course, you know, of the, uh, the, the people who are in that gray area, authorities sort of do this kind of assessment where they uh, consider them tier one, tier two, tier three, based on the available evidence, the available intelligence. They make an assessment of who's more dangerous, who poses an immediate threat, a not so immediate threat, and not much of a threat. I guess it was another technical term, I apologize. Um, the Koshi brothers were, rightly so, deemed to be a top threat at the beginning. The guy went to Iraq. They're ties to the, really the upper echelons of Al-Qaeda. So every year, French intelligence has a review of the cases. You review the file and say, okay, what have the Koshi brothers done? Nothing. 
from 2010 to, 2000, to December 2014, when the final assessment of the Koshi brothers is done, for five years, the Koshi brothers had basically not been online, not, not consumers of propaganda, with one tiny exception, they haven't interacted with other jihadists, with other like-minded individuals, they mind their business. They seem to be no longer interested in jihadist ideology, which happens. We have a lot of guys who grow out of it for one reason or the other and no longer part of that, that, that milieu. So what do you do? You have limited resources. You cannot go in front of a judge by, for the fifth year in a row and say, listen, these guys who don't even go on Facebook, they pose a major challenge, they pose a major threat. And the mobilization for Syria has started. France has seen 1,700 people from France to go to Syria and join ISIS. If I'm French intelligence, I'm saying, these guys, I need more people to look at those guys going to Syria, rather than these two brothers, they're probably getting old, they're no longer interested in this stuff, it's, it's old news. So December 2014, they basically stopped monitoring them. They put them in the lower, lowest tier. Three weeks later, they carry out the attack. How could you have predicted that? How could you know? Very, very, very difficult. So what do you do with that? I think in a bit maybe I, I close. Yep. Um, short of turning upside down some very, very basic and fundamental uh, rights and liberties which characterize life in the West in a democratic society, which I don't think anybody really advocates uh, doing, there are certain dynamics which we just have to deal with, and that's the, the reality of it. Uh, one can advocate that more resources will be useful. Uh, more people you have, the, the, the more you can, you can follow people. Uh, the more knowledge you have, I think there's, you know, obviously certain gaps from a technological point of view. It's uh, that law enforcement intelligence agencies are uh, playing catch up from a technological point of view with terrorists. That's, uh, that's clear, there's, there's this constant migration that the terrorists do from one platform to the other online, and it's very, very, get, getting very difficult, even for the FBI, let alone for the less technologically sophisticated European counterparts, uh, to keep up uh, with, um, with these technological developments. So there are certain things that can be done, the, the, the usual better intelligence sharing, domestically and internationally, a lot of things can be improved, but I think it's clear that there are certain dynamics which are inevitable. Uh, the FBI has, as one of its main techniques, the idea of putting uh, um, undercover agents, agents provocateurs, infiltrators, the name, you know, the, the, the sting operations, different names used for it, which is the idea of how do you act, what do you do with these guys who are in the gray area? The approach that the FBI often uses is, uh, after a careful assessment of the case, sending in somebody who's either an undercover FBI agent or an asset and basically approach the individual uh, and gain his trust, basically tell him, listen, I'm an ISIS recruiter, I'm a like-minded ISIS supporter or something like that and basically start having, creating a, a report with that individual. Um, everything is wiretapped, everything is meticulously uh, recorded, and basically uh, leading or at least accompanying the person in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a trajectory of radicalization that leads to that individual trying to carry out an attack. Um, in some cases you have cases in which the FBI would supply a vehicle, uh, with um, what the individual, the target, thinks are explosives, and then the individual would push a button, thinking uh, that he's, you know, he's parked the car in front of, uh, of a federal building, a synagogue, or whatever, pushes the button, there's no explosion, there's only 25 FBI agents that point a gun at him and they arrest him. That's basically what happens. And that's, uh, that's a very effective technique, now we can talk about it from a civil liberties point of view, there's been a lot of criticism of that and some of it granted, fair, um, some not so much. Uh, but if you look at it from the narrow lenses of counterterrorism, uh, very effective technique. We've had at least around 110 cases 
since 9-11, uh, but have gone to court uh, and it involved the use of uh, sting operation of uh, FBI informants, uh, undercover agents, and there's been a, a conviction rate of 99%. Uh, so it's extremely effective from that point of view. It's clear that you can now use it all the time. You don't solve the problem just by using this very effective technique. And this is part of, uh, um, it should be part of a comprehensive counterterrorism strategy, but not the only component. What the Europeans do is a completely different approach, uh, which is a softer approach. Europeans are a bit softer. Uh, the idea of approaching the individual that is in that gray area, the individual who is clearly radicalized but has not yet crossed the, the line into criminally relevant behavior, and instead of uh, here the Italian PowerPoint is helpful. So if the FBI sort of leads, if we see radicalization as a, sort of a straight line, a trajectory that starts here and ends here, the FBI sort of accompanies this individual in this radicalization process. Basically what the FBI says is that this individual is gonna radicalize. No matter what, he's gonna eventually radicalize so much that he's gonna try to carry out an attack. He's gonna do it no matter what. We might as well be accompanying him and be sort of overseeing, if you will, that process uh, because it's a controlled explosion. So we are there, we're gonna be the ones supplying him the explosives, which are gonna be fake, instead of somebody who's the real deal and giving him the real explosives. And that's a very fair approach, and I think it's, it's as I said, quite effective. The Europeans, though, take the opposite approach. Again, the individual who's here in the gray, gray area, the Europeans approach him and try to take him back to de-radicalize him. What they do, it's sort of the, the dynamics that we see in gang prevention programs in the United States, uh, the scare straight approach, uh, having mentors approaching these individuals. Keep in mind, uh, we're talking in many cases about 15, 16 year old kids, talking about very young people, uh, which in many cases doesn't make them less dangerous. We've had a, a, a bomb uh, put together by a 12 year old in Germany and it didn't go off for a minor, minor, minor defect in the trigger, but it was very professionally crafted by a 12-year-old in Germany. So I'm not gonna diminish the fact that you have very young people who can be very dangerous. But again, in many cases, a, a scare straight approach, uh, some kind of mentoring uh, can, can help. And so the Europeans who don't use the sting operation approach that the FBI uses, they do the opposite. They do a softer approach where it generates former militants Again, very similar to what happens in the States with gangs, where former gang members go inside schools or uh, talk one-on-one -on -one to people who are young people who are in the process of joining gangs uh, and tell them why joining a gang was a mistake, why uh, it ruined their lives. What the Europeans do is they have former jihadists, uh, people who are part of that milieu, or other people. It could be imams, it could be relatives, uh, different, different uh, people who approach young people and try to convince them, try to engage them in a conversation and try to de-radicalize them, trying them to stop them from going further in this radicalization line. And of course it works in some cases, it doesn't work in others. There's not a 100% success rate. And it, I think it's a useful approach as well. What we've been advocating for a while is that the US needs an approach that has both tactics, the hard and the soft. You're gonna have cases in which you need the hard approach, you need to arrest people. I think in some other cases, you need the softer approach. And there's been uh, some attempts in the United States to introduce this softer approach uh, as well. I'm going way beyond my time on this. So how about I wrap it up here and I wait for your, for your questions. Okay.